Hi, um, thank you so much for agreeing to serve as one of our mentors this year for our virtual mentorship program. And today we're very excited to have Ms. Elizabeth Luis with us to talk about international and community-based research and clinical work. Um, so Elizabeth, could you start with telling us a bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm a fifth year um, doctoral candidate um, from the University of Georgia. And I'm here on internship with the Center for Multicultural Training um, in Psychology. Um, it's here based in Boston with Boston University and Boston Medical Center. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm originally from Miami, Florida. And um, I pursued my master's from Boston College as well. And some of my interests include um, global mental health work, trauma work, um, working with ethnic and racial minorities, and, um, and also humanitarian uh, work as well. So those are some of my interests. Mm -hmm. Those interests sounds very inspirational. Um, and I know many of the students that are listening right now may be interested in conducting research both, conducting both research and clinical work in global mental health. Um, and while they certainly inform one another, it may be hard to talk about both of them simultaneously. And I certainly know you have experience in both of them. So how about we start with talking more about your research experience, especially in the um, international context? Yeah, sure. Um, because I knew I wanted to do international work, so I sort of sought out some research experiences. So um, I'm Haitian American as well, and um, I've been reading for the yeah throughout my graduate work um, on um, one of the Haitian American pioneers in the mental health field, um, which is Dr. Gera Nicolas, and she's from the University of Miami. Me. Um, so I've always been reading her, her articles. So I said, okay, let me, you know, um, reach out to her to learn more about her work in Haiti and get um, get a chance to talk to her further. And um, she extended an opportunity to um, come to Haiti with her in 2015. Um, and it was a great experience to see the work that she's been doing there because she's been working in Haiti now for over 27 years. Mm -hmm. And um, and she's been working there, you know, not just as a native and um, as a professor and as a, a psychologist, but she's been um, really engaged in a lot of community-based work. And one of her work, her projects is working with teachers mm -hmm. um, to, um, to sort of provide workshops that are sustainable and led by the teachers themselves after they receive training on mental health um, sort of um, awareness. So to help them recognize signs and symptoms within their students and in the community. And then within also her, um, her workshop, she also um, makes sure to implement information about um, our, the historical context, um, also the Haitian identity, the Haitian psyche. So it was really um, a great experience to understand some of, the, some of the work that goes into doing international research and um, to be part of it and to be able to facilitate some of those discussions was great. Um, and they use like um, post um, pre pre tests and post tests as well to recognize, you know, what type of information that the teachers came in with, and then also afterwards what what type of information they they left with. Mm -hmm. um, and then also other opportunities have been. Um, working with another Haitian American organization called Global Trauma Research. Mm -hmm. And, and um, with them too, they do community-based um, mental health workshops as well. And it's in within a, the community as well. Um, and it really is um, a project that really um, also involves the participants that include teachers, to religious leaders, to students, um, to different Haitian professionals. Um, and, and with the whole objective too, for it to be sustainable as well. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it's sort of like a, a network of itself in which people are able to, um, refer to each other and lean on each other for support. And then, um, another research project that I was involved in was, um, with the U S state department through the Bourne fellowship. And with that, that opportunity, um, allowed me to write a proposal about why, um, Haitian mental health is important to U.S. national security, mm -hmm. and I was selected for this um, award, and I spent 10 months in Haiti, so that was a really also interesting underground experience as well. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for sharing all of those wonderful experiences you've had, and it sounds like kind of one led to another. First, you can reach out to one of the inspirational um, scholars in the field and got opportunity to have that exposure, and then you continue with multiple projects eventually and to your own 
um, scholarship. And that's awesome. Um, so what made you interested in this line of research? Because I know like students in the United States oftentimes have many opportunities to engage in all kinds of research projects. What made you so determined that you want to study what's going on in Haiti? Um, well, because I think um, part of like, um, you know, growing up as a Haitian American and being exposed to the Haitian community in Miami and with Haitian Creole being my first language, mm -hmm. I've always felt connected um, to my um, to my um, ethnic background and heritage. So um, it's really been sort of uh, um, more and more of a forth at the forefront because of um, the different sort of types of natural disasters is um, overcome in terms of hurricanes to earthquake, uh, earthquakes to um, just different types of challenges. And um, I'm, I've been very um, just, um, just admire sort of the, just the, the skills and just the way of life that Haitians continue to, um, to, to continue to um, live out just um, despite the, the challenges that they face and also understanding that their strengths and also because um, I didn't have much exposure to this in the in like my American you know um, mm -hmm. graduate program or just um, undergrad so it's something that I really saw it. and also I wanted to learn more about um, mental health in that sense and what is part of the Haitian psyche and and how do we sort of as a people as a country sort of um, continue to um, find ways to be resilient to be um, to advocate for each other and and just um, how do we sort of address um, challenges that are day to day so um, it really encouraged me to to really get to know the community as well because I also understand that I bring an American context as well mm -hmm. so really um, being intentional too about when I visit not just with family members and friends but also intentional in my work and doing research as well mm -hmm. to be considerate of the culture and considerate of things that I may not be catching as well mm -hmm. um, from my sort of experiences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I can hear that it's it's personally and professionally meaningful, and I really appreciate you sharing about how you're staying very humble and open to um, the whole research process there, and then be really intentional in your approach. Um, so I wonder if you can tell us more about what kind of opportunities in addition to what you've shared, and also if there have been any challenges for you to engage in either research projects that's ongoing or carrying out your own projects in Haiti. Yeah, I think in terms of, you know, with carrying out um, projects um, in an international context, um, there are some challenges that you foresee and don't see. And I think one of the important um, things that I learned earlier on is that it's important to understand um, not just the culture, but the regional sort of nuances. Mm -hmm. um, and then also understand terminology of mental health words that um, might be primarily Western based, but really making sure that you're understanding the, how, how the culture itself um, contextualizes it. Mm -hmm. And then also um, expanding your, expanding my sense of um, understanding of diversity because um, Haiti is a predominantly black um, nation. Mm -hmm. So understanding different also subgroups, subcategories of diversity and, and how um, Haitians view um, their own identities. Mm -hmm. um, and I think other challenges too is that sometimes, especially when it's like sort of time specific, um, there are things that are unpredictable, whether it's um, natural disasters or um, some um, in-country conflicts. Um, there are some challenges that um, that I didn't foresee, and it's important to be flexible, it's important to be creative, it's important to mm -hmm. um, have plan Bs and Cs, mm -hmm. um, and really continue to be, um, to be mindful of um, what's your purpose there, and also recognizing that even if the project doesn't go exactly how you plan, um, it's still making a difference, and, um, and also making sure that you're involving the, the stakeholders, like the local people mm -hmm. in the community as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and could you tell us more about where do you find the most support along this process? Because it sounds like there could be a lot of foreseen and unforeseen um, challenges along this. Way. Yeah, I think um, really having mentors like, um, like Dr. Nikolai and um, others who have been doing work for years in Haiti mm -hmm. and uh, reaching out to them, asking them questions. I think also observing um, some of the work that are being led by, you know, um, 
the people in the country who are Haitian too mm -hmm. um, and understanding their mechanisms. Mm -hmm. And I think um, also reading about the literature um, and seeing, you know, what are some gaps or some other ways to think about doing international research work um, a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's, um, there's resources, while it may not be in the academic form, but mm -hmm. there is so much um, even within the, within the communities that mm -hmm. can really sort of help you to see things a little bit differently or to consider something differently mm -hmm. or um, extend your timeline. Mm -hmm. um, so I think those are some things that come to mind for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so earlier you mentioned about you spent 10 months in Haiti to carry out your research. So I was wondering as a doctoral student who's product, predominantly based in the U.S., how did you navigate that process? And I think that might be a question a lot of us could ask. Yeah, I mean, like. I knew, yeah, I knew when I came into the doctoral um, um, program that I wanted to spend, um, if possible, a year in Haiti or, or so, um, because it was very important to me because I thought that this was um, a career that I wanted to pursue. Mm -hmm. So for me, um, earlier on, I made sure that I um, completed my coursework <laughs> as uh, in a timely process. So I completed within the three years, including summers. And then I applied and then I spoke to the um, born representative um, that was at my campus to learn more about um, graduate students application process and um, the rate of acceptance. So I sort of was looking at this potentially um, within my second or third year. So I was trying to plan ahead. Mm -hmm. And then I applied and, um, and I received the support from my program. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then, um, yeah, and then I moved there. Mm -hmm. um, September, um, 2017. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so it was, um, it was definitely also a challenging process because it's like, you know, this is something that is not a norm, mm -hmm. um, to do during your graduate work. And then also, um, challenges in terms of, um, recognizing how to keep your graduate student status or, mm -hmm. um, being sure you're meeting the policies and re regulations of the, of your institution's international study um, department as well, mm -hmm. and making sure you're meeting your department, you know, credits or needs and stuff like that. Um, and then also making sure I'm reviewing um, US, um, the US um, um, sort of level of security, because I know that there have been times that um, Haiti has been on an alert list and Americans can fly or go there. So. So all that was uh, was important in the timing of it too, and and, and I'm really navigating some of those um, some of those systems and policies and laws mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, I heard that a lot of thoughtful planning has been gone into this to make it happen, and I'm really mm -hmm. again um, inspired by how much work you've put into this to um, really make it happen. And I can hear how meaningful it has been for you. And it's very encouraging for all of us who's heard this experience to know that this is um, a possibility, especially for those students who are highly interested in conducting research that's meaningful in international context. So, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah let's switch gear a little bit and talk more about like um, international community-based clinical work. Um, how about you tell us a bit about your experiences with that? Yeah, for me, um, my international experiences with clinical work has been very limited because, mm -hmm. um, once again, I, I didn't feel comfortable to do clinical work um, because I didn't have supervision from a psychologist mm -hmm. doing my work abroad. But um, some of the things that were sort of um, similar or um, near to cl um, clinical work was um, holding psychoeducation groups for teachers and parents mm -hmm. about child development and um, learning and um, learning disabilities and and, um, and really trying to use a strengths-based approach mm -hmm. um, within a school setting. Mm -hmm. um, other works that I've done is um, working on a trauma curriculum with uh, partners in health, mental, mental health team mm -hmm. um, to really understand and conceptualize the word trauma since um, it really doesn't exist in the Haitian Creole language and, mm -hmm. um, and understanding some um, contextual and cultural sort of language um, that um, sort of is similar to the word trauma. Um, so that, um, so with that, that included like doing focus groups and really doing some literature re um, review and, um, and um, really creating, helping to assist to create um, a curriculum that would inform training and um, therapy. Mm 
Um, so I think those are some examples in which I've sort of, um, that are sort of, um, I think can inform clinical work, um, but I haven't had personal experience with, um, with doing clinical work just because I wanted to be um, supervised by a psychologist um, and I just didn't want to just do clinical work, especially as I was continuing to learn about the culture as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think you brought up great, I mean, very reasonable and important concerns in terms of the type of clinical supervision you can get in an international context. And I think maybe there will be more freedom once you become licensed or this is something that can be future, yeah. like developed but I understand as graduate yeah, yeah. students. And even, yeah, and even when I become licensed, I would want to still be supervised by a licensed psychologist um, just, to, um, just to ensure that I'm, I'm, I'm staying informed and I'm being ethical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it's just like how someone in another country can't just come and practice in the U.S. without, you know, certain other criteria or so, mm -hmm. or um, really try to work in a process to pos potentially get licensed in Haiti as well. Mm -hmm. And from what you share, like all the psychoeducation, also just understanding the word trauma or the experience of trauma in Haiti sounds like very important work. And like you said, can inform a lot of clinical practice. Mm -hmm. um, and it sounds like you stay very connected with local organizations and psychologists in Haiti. So um, I'm sure that you're doing what you can within like your abilities as a graduate student. Yes, yes. <laughs> So what about community-based work? Earlier you mentioned about your interest in working with minority individuals. So you want to tell us more about that? Yeah, so um, yeah, internationally, I've worked with programs that have focused on like um, programs that lift young girls um, to learn um, to uh, sort of um, reinforce some confidence and self-esteem about their identity as black girls in Haiti. Um, so that's been um, very informative as well. And I participated a little bit in um, asking questions about um, what, which type of sort of dolls, um, um, whether a white doll or black doll that um, Haitian girls um, sort of um, preferred and sometimes it was mixed, but it was very interesting too that um, even the perceptions of, um, of skin tone and black identity can also be something that can be challenging for girls and um, young women and women in general um, within the society um, when sometimes lighter skin or other perceptions of beauty can be um, portrayed as better. Um, and also other community-based projects have been um, doing humanitarian work mm -hmm. um, after the hurricane of 2016, mm -hmm. um, Hurricane Matthew, um, me along with an organization of, of Haitian nurses as well, mm -hmm. um, um, we, um, we volunteered in Haiti and they set up like a sort of like a um, like a urgent care sort of camp. Mm -hmm. So they had like your pharmacists, your nurses, and then you had your mental health sort of team mm -hmm. um, that I participated with um, Dr. Florence St. Jean as well, mm -hmm. of Global Trauma Research. And it was really um, a humbling experience to, to really, um, pr um, to be able to serve and see some of the needs of the communities mm -hmm. that, we, um, that we visited um, after this um, hurricane disaster. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was a really eye-opening experience and something that I hope to continue to build upon in terms of um, seeing how to create initiatives to, um, per, to sort of develop with locals um, more preparedness around natural disasters like hurricanes mm -hmm. and um, prevention programs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that sounds awesome. And you mentioned about a team of psychologists or psychology students going for... Um, to Haiti after. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, I will let my, I will let them know to cut this part out. I hurt not. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's fine. Um, okay. Are there any questions you hope I can ask more? I know I've been asking mostly from the list I've prepared. 
I think those are those are good questions. Yeah, I think those are good questions. Yeah. Um, let's see. Yeah. So going back, I mean, I'm gonna start. So to help her cut, I'm gonna say <laughs> let's resume here. Um, yeah, that sounds awesome that you were able to go in um, to Haiti to after. Hurricane Matthew to be there with the community. And I'm sure, like you said, it's a very humbling experience and also a very unique and meaningful experience. So could you tell us more about like how you were able to like engage in such an effort and what that process was like? Yeah, I mean, because through my networks, so mm -hmm. when that happened, you know, there's a lot of different Haitian networks and I reach out to them within my network and they're looking for volunteers and I volunteered. So um, I think also with doing this, during this work, um, the international work doesn't have to be, you know, primarily with mental health professionals or psychologists, but it could be with counselor educators, it could be with nurses. Mm -hmm. um, so I think even expanding how we do interdisciplinary work um, overseas mm -hmm. um, and how we sort of build rapport, build relationships, um, can also help sort of reinforce, you know, the 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 purposes the plans you know um that we that we have um to serve um to serve um communities abroad mm -hmm. yeah um sounds great how do you balance doing both research and clinical work in general just as a doctoral student um i think um they both inform each other so for me um it's been helpful to see how they are both sort of um, important for me. So for me, I really do um, try to sort of um, um, continue to stay um, focused on both. Um, I mean, I know there's sometimes, you know, because right now I'm on internship, so it's, it's a little bit harder to, you know, do more research or stuff like that, or even my clinical work um, in the US sort of even makes me question, you know, things going on in Haiti and abroad. So I think um, for me, um, I want to do, you know, um, I believe I want to be like a clinical researcher. Mm -hmm. So sort of doing a little bit of both um, or finding ways to do that um, in meaningful ways. Mm -hmm. So I think not losing sight of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And, and certainly, like you shared, a lot of times when you are um, part of doctoral, you are in the process of obtaining your doctoral degree, like there are gifts and, gifts and takes in terms of how much you can engage and how much you can devote yourself to the type of work that you find really meaningful for. And there are times um, that we have to find ways to remind ourselves about where our passion lies. Um, and so what kind of tips do you have for um, listeners who may be interested in engaging in international and community-based research and clinical work? Um, I think tips is, you know, um, you know, reaching out to people that you've been reading about, organizations you've been excited to, to work with or learn about, um, and reach out to them. You never know what these opportunities can lead. Um, you know, really seeking opportunities outside of the field of psychology, outside of the field of mental health, um, because the international community, the international, you know, world, um, it has so many different sort of strengths and so many different, you know, um, expertise and so many different people that can, um, that you can collaborate with. And also um, staying connected to Division 52, that has been helpful as well. Um, and then also seeking out different opportunities with international conferences. Like I've been to the Pan-African um, Conference of Psychology. It was in Durban, um, South Africa in September 2017. And prior to that, I think I went to... Um, I went to the International Congress of Psychology in Yokohama, Japan, mm -hmm. and that was in summer um, 2016. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and with those opportunities, my graduate institution provided me with funding to pay for my flight. And then after that, I just sought out maybe different scholarships or I budgeted. And that's a way to also meet different other, other professionals, other people from different cultures, international communities. And then also the APA, um, memorandum MOU that they have with different countries um, last last September 2018 I traveled with APA I applied and um, was selected 
and um, we went to Portugal. So we went to the Portuguese conference for a week. Mm-hmm. And, um, and still with that um, opportunity, I'm collaborating with a, with a um, fellow Portuguese African um, student. Um, so there are some opportunities that, um, that are available, with, whether it's your graduate school or your program that is willing to fund you for um, travel expenses mm-hmm. or even APA MOUs. Um, Those are some great opportunities as well. And I think um, continuing to stay up to date with some of the developments of regions that you're interested in. Um, Also, I did an informational interview with Partners in Health. If there's an organization that you see yourself working with or working in in the future, um, do informational interviews. You just never know. And they, um, after speaking to them, learning more about their programs, it seemed like an organization that I would want to work in. And I did that when I was in my master's program. Mm-hmm. And that was one of the reasons why I pursued a PhD, um, because they said that um, one would be um, needed. So, um, so you just never know, um, you know, thinking outside of the box, um, really uncovering opportunities, you know, even uncovering opportunities within your international office. That's how I found out about, about the Bourne Fellowship. There's also the Fulbright, you know, I applied to the Fulbright. Um, I wasn't selected for it, but you just never, but those experiences help you to learn how to like, write up these proposals, how to write up these essays, you know, um, and then now, um, I'm, and now I had, um, last, last, um, fall during my, um, internship year, mm-hmm. well, in the midst of applying for postdocs, I applied for, uh, NIH Fogarty Fellowship mm-hmm. to do clinical research and, pro- and, um, wrote up a proposal to do in Rwanda for to to be there for a year and I was selected in the initial round so now I'm waiting to see if NIH will approve that proposal mm-hmm. and it currently right now I've accepted a postdoc with um, Boston University to do um, a global mental health fellowship so there are definitely different opportunities that um, you know browse the website Google mm-hmm. your um, international office your graduate school um, division 52 APA Mm -hmm. Um, other conferences as well international conferences um, it's very endless it's very endless Mm -hmm. well awesome thank you so much for sharing all those wonderful resources places to look for and a great opportunities and also embracing the unexpected like you said like just keep developing the networks and you never know what kind of opportunities may occur through those networks and attending international conferences um, and I'm really glad that you talk about expenses because I think that's something that a lot of graduate students definitely are concerned about, which a lot of times those international travel costs a lot more. So um, contacting our own programs and also looking for potential fundings um, locally as well. So great, great advice. Um, thank you. I'm just curious about if there's any other things that you feel like you would like to share with our was our audience today in terms of um, just personal and professional development in general as someone who's passionate about not only not only like um, developing within the US or but also thinking about like applying their work in an international context in the future because I think the challenge may be um, also about like whether um, in the future, whether someone want to be based in the U.S. and conducting research internationally versus moving to an international context and conducting research and clinical work there um, while maintaining relationships or networks in the U.S. Um, yeah, those are challenges that I feel like, you know, um, if you're interested in this work that you're going to have to speak with your family about, your partner, you know, about, and any other significant others um, to see what is the best fit. Um, because there are people who are based in the U.S. and they fly out to do work every couple of months. Mm-hmm. Or there's people who are based in the U.S. and they do work from the U.S. There's people who live abroad and can come to the U.S. Um, a few times or are strictly abroad. So it really depends on what type of lifestyle you want to um, live in and then also recognizing what are some of the um, benefits or, or challenges that, um, that may be prone to within that particular context. Mm-hmm. Also, if you're interested in living abroad, um, I would encourage people to also you know, visit the place that you're interested in um, doing research in because sometimes when we get to a place and we're only focused on research, 
really, um, I would encourage you to like visit the place when you're not doing a research trip or a community based trip, but really just to visit, you know, to really take in and be a little bit more present because also that can also inform some of your, um, just your thoughts about the place, how you're feeling about the place. Um, and I think, you know, if it's important, if you don't speak the local language or, Mm -hmm. you know, pick up another language, international language, that could also be a bonus. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, and also when you're doing work overseas, um, if there are similar organizations that you're interested in, you know, look more about what they're doing, you know, find out about them, you know, we don't all have to be in a silo. Mm -hmm. Um, and then also being mindful of what is your American identity, if you, if you do have one, or um, the different identities that you bring to that culture, um, how, how, do, how can that, you know, affect how people interact with you, how people perceive you, um, because that can also be um, verbal or nonverbal, you know, um, and then also being very, very reflective in the process, too, um, and um, really challenging any particular biases you may hold that you may not be aware of as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, those are all wonderful, um, wonderful piece of advice. And, and, and then, like you said, it's a very, it can be a very personal journey as well in terms of deciding what's the best route moving forward for one's career and also um, the process of continued reflections on our own bias, what we bring to the table, how we can be connected to organizations locally and really figuring out what the meaning of this work is. Um, yeah, and I really appreciate um, Ms. Louise and maybe soon to be Dr. Louise uh, mm-hmm. spending this time with all of us to sharing your experiences and your wisdom and your advice for all of us who may be interested in engaging in international community-based research and clinical work. Um, and I know that you've also graciously offered to speak with three mentees in the future. So we'll be contacting you um, in the next few weeks to see if there are any students who can benefit really like more of an intimate conversation and relationship maybe from you moving forward. So thank you so much again for devoting your time for our Division 45 Virtual Mentorship Program. Thank you. Thank you.